Thank you, Pastor Elbin. Good morning once again. Well, how did trick-or-treating go out in the, the wind there last night? I was actually thinking back to when our kids were younger. Um, boy, if you're ever going to pick a Saturday to give parents an extra night of an extra hour of sleep, uh, that's probably a good one. They come home sugared up, and it's hard to get them in bed. Uh, so an extra hour made a lot of sense, and I hope you enjoyed it. Um, if not, if you're still a little sleepy, you might want to reach in your pocket for that Halloween candy you brought with you today and maybe get a little mini Snickers to power us through this morning. Well, we're continuing in our journey through the book of Acts, and uh, we're coming to a portion of the text here where we get kind of an update on the status of the church, the early church, and then we hear another narrative section at the beginning of chapter 5. And again, we learn about this uh, mission of the church, the unity and the oneness that they're enjoying as a church, and it produces in them this gospel-empowered generosity. There's an impact the gospel is making in multiple ways, and so one of the particular followers of Jesus, a guy named Barnabas, he sets a really good example for us of what it means to give reverently. And then that is set up as kind of a contrast with some other followers of Jesus named Ananias and Sapphira. They are also part of the early church. And here we find a rather shocking, fairly disturbing uh, record of something that did happen in the history of the early church. Uh, it's a little discouraging in one way, and, yes, it, and yet it makes us mindful that even the early church wasn't perfect, despite their good start, despite the Holy Spirit being there, they were still having their own challenges and struggles. And so we read the story of greed, and we learn about this hypocritical plan to pretend to give more than they actually gave. And in the midst of these different examples, good and bad, what we get to do this morning as a church here in Bemidji is to think about what it means to practice reverent giving. And before we dive into the text, why don't we pray together? Would you please bow with me? Lord God, we do thank you for your word. We thank you for the truth it contains and just how relevant it is for us day after day. And as we consider this story from the early church, we pray, Lord, that by your spirit you would enlighten this text, give us great understanding of the truth that's here, and give us the courage and the follow-through to apply this text to our lives, uh, to live it out in a way that would bring you glory. And in order to do that, we pray for your help now. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, I hope your Bible's already open to Acts 4.32, and I would encourage you actually every single Sunday, whoever is speaking, to have your Bible open. Uh, we do what we can with the slides here on ProPresenter to make it real easy to follow along, especially as we jump around multiple texts. Um, but even this morning, you'll see there'll be a few times where it would be nice to have your own Bible open in front of you just to keep an idea of the flow of what's happening as we move a little quickly and from time to time jump around just a little bit. Well, 432 flows right out of this great uh, thing we learned about last week in terms of the life of the church. They're speaking the word of God boldly. There's this boldness that comes as the Holy Spirit fills them and tied into that becomes this shared mission. The early church, these believers, they were on mission together. They were pumped about Jesus. They were declaring the gospel. God was doing incredible things. And as they worked together and served together and saw God moving together, it led the early church to become this incredible community, this amazing community. And it is so exciting for us to look into it and see this faith community. The description begins in verse 32. All the believers were in one heart, one mind. No one claimed that any of their possessions was their own, but they shared everything they had. And that's how the description begins. Luke records this. He wants us to know what it looks like at that time in history. And what we don't find anywhere in this initial description is any kind of obvious greed or hoarding we don't find this combative struggle where they say, well, what's mine is mine and what's yours is yours. 
It's quite the opposite of anything like that that maybe you've even found yourself or heard yourself say something like that from time to time or heard others say something like that. But instead, here it's this beautiful, refreshing picture, oneness of heart and mind, sharing everything with each other. Such an attractive picture to consider. And yet right away, many of us might already be wondering, well, wait a, wait a second. What exactly do they mean by sharing everything? How did this actually work? Like, how's that, how's that going to work? Are we talking here about an all-out commune where everybody owned everybody's stuff and they all lived together and it all belonged legally, literally, to all of them? Are we talking about a certain type of like Christian socialism or some type of like communism? Like, what, what do we mean here? What exactly is going on in the early church? And it's actually quite simple. What's happening in Acts 4, what this is talking about, is a voluntary generosity toward other believers. That's it. And the simplicity of it, and really the, the lack of real structure or mandate or anything like that, there, there's none of that. And that's part of what made it so radical. This was God-honoring. This was grace-empowered, voluntary sharing. And it's a beautiful picture. In other words, we shouldn't jump to any conclusions that in the early church, when you became part of the church, the church seized all your assets, and now they owned all your stuff. That's not it at all. This was not apostolic overreach. This was overflow. Not overreach, but overflow from all that God was doing in the midst of the hearts and minds of his people. So people's own personal private property continued to be just that, their own personal private property. And we can decipher this pretty clearly if we jump ahead just real quickly to Acts 5.4. Peter asked them, didn't it belong to you before it was sold? And after it was sold, wasn't the money at your disposal? In other words, Ananias and Sapphira show us that the property was theirs. It didn't belong to the church or belong to the church family. It was still their personal property. So the key to Acts 4.32 was a heart attitude. No one claimed that any of their possessions was their own. In other words, it all belongs to God. We each understand as we come to follow Christ that we're merely stewards our own personal private property is something that God has given us to steward for his purposes, to be a blessing to others. John Stott says it this way, although in fact and in law they continued to own their goods, yet in heart and mind they cultivated an attitude so radical that they thought of their own possessions as being available to help their needy sisters and brothers in Christ. Verses 33 and 34 go on to explain, with great power the apostles continued to testify to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus. So they were preaching the gospel. They were sharing the good news. They were telling people about Jesus. That continued to go on day after day. And God's grace was so powerfully at work in them all, meaning the believers, that there were no needy persons among them. What an incredible thing to think about. No needy persons among them. Not just that it could be this way, but that it was that way in the early church. In other words, even as they continued to powerfully declare the gospel to the lost, the gospel of grace was also having an impact on the found, on the believers. Their love for one another, there was a powerful thing happening that the gospel was doing. The impact of the gospel was not just outward, it was also inward. Inward. 
Not just outward to the community around them, but inward to the community of faith. The gospel was growing and forming them into greater Christ-likeness. They were being literally transformed by the very message they were preaching and declaring. It was changing them more and more. And the truth and power of God's grace was making them into a community like no other community. One author puts it this way, the fullness of the Spirit is manifest in deed as well as word, in service as well as witness, in love for the family as well as testimony to the world. Jesus said it this way in John 13, a new command I give you, love one another. As I have loved you, so you must love one another. And by this, everyone will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. You see, that was the hallmark of a Christ follower. It was the distinguishing mark of a Christ follower, love for one another. This was true for the early church, still holds true for the way Ephri Bemidji wants to be and ought to be. A significant part of our Christian testimony to those around us is that they look into this community and see how we love each other, how we care for one another, how as a church community we are for each other and we are with each other and we are following Jesus together. We're in it together. And there's a direct correlation between our confession of the gospel and our generosity toward one another. Our confession of the gospel and our generosity toward one another dovetail together. They're hand in hand. Acts 4, 34 and 35 goes on. From time to time, those who owned land or houses sold them, brought the money from the sales and put it at the apostles' feet and it was distributed to anyone who had need. And at this point in time, the early church was, do you remember how big the church had gotten by this point? about 5,000 households. This was not the little gathering we first encountered in Acts 1 where it was about 120 people. This had grown into quite a big gathering of believers. And we don't know that they gathered in one place, but we know that they identified together as fellow believers. And so it made sense to entrust these dollars to the leadership who could then disperse them across the wide variety of different needs and different places people lived throughout Jerusalem. And Acts 4 actually ends with this godly example of Barnabas. Joseph is his real name, his given name, a Levite from Cyprus, whom the apostles called Barnabas, which means son of encouragement. He sold the field that he owned, brought the money that was his money, and put it at the apostles' feet. His real name was Joseph, his nickname by the apostles, they called him Barnabas. They thought of him as an encouraging person. And he may either have had the gift of encouragement or he just had a reputation. His street cred was he is an encouraging guy. And what an encouraging thing it was for him to come and bring this gift before the church and say, please use this to help the poor and distribute it whatever way you see fit. What an encouragement that is to any of us when we see somebody have such a great act of kindness and generosity. However, if you think about it, this is in stark contrast to what Jesus once said about helping the poor. See, in Matthew 6, Jesus said, but when you give to the needy, do not let your left hand know what your right hand is doing so that your giving may be in secret. So how do we reconcile these two things, this public act of generosity and then Jesus' words about keeping it private? Many of us as Christians today, we prefer to keep our giving confidential. That's actually how our church practices uh, giving. And so tithing and offerings and other special gifts, that's between you and the Lord. It's between me and the Lord. And we have just a couple people who count those funds and deposit them, but... The whole church does not know. 
And yet, as we read through Acts 4 and 5, there seems to be this pattern in the early church where believers bring these gifts publicly, not all their gifts, but at least these special gifts, there seems to be a more public act, and they don't seem particularly bothered by that. And in fact, if you get into Acts 5, you'll see it's the same way with Barnabas as with Ananias and Sapphira. They just come forward publicly and give the gift. Believers would bring it to the apostles, and other people would see them doing this. Now, granted, we're not told the actual amount. We're not given a, a cash dollar amount of how much it was. Um, we just know that it's whatever money he got for selling a field, and land has always been pretty valuable. It probably was a fair amount of money that he brought. But there's nothing in the text here to suggest that God didn't approve of Barnabas giving this way or that the other members of the church thought he was out of line to do that publicly. You don't really get that sense. In fact, um, when we get further here, Luke is writing the book of Acts, and he actually uses Barnabas' gift of this uh, generosity as a contrast to show us what was off and what was wrong about the way Ananias and Sapphira gave. But they both bring it publicly. As we'll soon see, the motivation behind our giving and the attitude of our hearts is of far greater importance than how public or private our giving is. Let me read that one more time. The motivation behind our giving and the attitude of our hearts is of far greater importance than how public or private our giving is. Apparently, Barnabas' public act of being generous inspired others to want to be generous as well and that's the great thing about generosity is it can really be very attractive and it can kind of get spreading around and a lot of people enjoy yeah let's be generous together that's a really good thing what's not so good is the way that Ananias and Sapphira went about their giving rather than reverent generosity what we see is a pretend generosity and that gets us to Acts 5, verse 1. Now a man named Ananias, together with his wife Sapphira, also told, sold a piece of property. And again, if we didn't already had Pastor Elbin read the whole story, when we get to this verse, things are still looking pretty good. It's still all pretty much, you know, happiness and lollipops. Everybody loves each other. Everybody's sharing. Barnabas sold the field, took the money, helped the church. Ananias and Sapphira, now they're going to sell their piece of property. This is great. Things are looking good. Everything's positive. This married couple, they sold the piece of property. It was their property. They had a right to sell it. It was their money. There were no obligation to really give any of it to the church. We talked about how this is a voluntary thing. They could have just kept the money and done whatever with it. Verse 2 goes on. With his wife's full knowledge, he kept back part of the money for himself, but brought the rest and put it at the apostles' feet. And even at this point, again, if we didn't know what was coming next, we would say, well, yeah, that's, that seems fine. There wasn't any rule that we're aware of that you had to give 100% of the money to the church. Well, there wasn't any rule you had to give any of it to help the poor. I mean, remember again, Acts 5.4, it talks about the land belonged to them. It was at their disposal how to use it. So up until this point, there's really no obvious reason why we would be bothered with them keeping back some of the money. Seems like that could be appropriate. And yet, we know there must be something else going on because we get to verse 3 and Peter calls him out. Ananias, how is it that Satan... Oh, where'd Satan come from? When did he start becoming part of what's happening here? He was active during the time of the early church. Peter says, how is it that Satan has so filled your heart and you have lied to the Holy Spirit? You've kept for yourself some of the money you received from the land and all of a sudden in one verse the whole tone changes. You know, we thought we were building toward this move of generosity and more and more people were being generous and now we're finding something very different. We go from the selling voluntarily 
of their own property, of their own money, to learning that it was all a lie, that Satan was at work. Something else must be going on here with Ananias and Sapphira. And so admittedly, we're going to need to read between the lines a little. We don't quite have all the information we maybe would like to kind of solve, like, what's up with this sudden change? What's going on? And so I'm going to propose two possibilities, two theories of what might be happening behind the scenes here. One possibility is that Ananias and Sapphira were taken captive by the sin of greed. Perhaps, and we weren't told this, but perhaps they had pledged that 100% of the proceeds from this piece of property were going to go to the poor. Perhaps they had said that that's what they're going to do, and then they pretended that that's what they were really giving when they came in front of the apostles. In other words, they had started with good intentions. Anybody here ever start with good intentions? Well, we talked about this in the first service. That's why some of us still have leaves in our yard. Good intentions to get those raked up. All of us can do that from time to time. They'd either made a vow to God, they'd made a pledge to the church, or they'd made some public statement that, hey, we love what we see Barnabas doing here. It's inspired us. We want to do that too. We're going to go sell this piece of property. We don't really need it. We're going to bring that money, and all of it's going to go to the church. They maybe got caught up in the excitement and, and, and the energy, and they started with such good intentions. The only problem was, Once they sold that piece of property, they maybe got even a little bit more money than they expected to get for it, and all of a sudden, that money is in their hands, and they're like, that's a chunk of change. (laughs) That's a lot of money. Maybe we should keep some of it. Maybe the church doesn't need all of that. And their greed got the best of them, and they went back on their promise. That's one theory, one possibility. They started thinking about all the other things that that money could buy. And there's always more things that our money can buy. And this scenario seems even more plausible when we jump ahead and look at the question that Peter asked Sapphira in verse 8. Peter asked her, tell me, is this the price you and Ananias got for the land? Yes, she said. That is the price. And so she seemed to indicate that Peter would expect them to bring the full price. And so she kind of played along with the the scheme here and said, yeah, that's all the money. Almost like, just like we agreed, it's all here. It wasn't that she was unaware of something her husband did on the side. They conspired together. They agreed to do this together. And so she tells a bold-faced lie. And she knows it's a lie. And somehow Peter knows that it's a lie. And more importantly, the Holy Spirit knows that it's a lie. They had conspired to test the Spirit of the Lord. And they paid for it with their very lives. Pretty shocking. That's one scenario. Here's another possibility. Ananias and Sapphira were taken captive by the sin of vanity. In other words, perhaps there never was a vow. There never was any plan to give all of the money to the church to help the poor. That was never maybe the scenario in the first place. But the plan all along was to try to look good, try to appear really generous, more generous than they were. And so the plan was to be just like Barnabas in appearance, but not in reality. And so maybe they conspired together thinking something like this. Okay, let's make sure that the details for the sale of the property are kept private. Nobody needs to know how much we really got for the land. All they need to know is what they think we got. And we'll just tell them some number and we'll, we'll keep some of the cash for ourselves We'll get full credit as though we gave all of it and we'll be looking good. 
In other words, their own pride and their own vanity may have been to work early on and led them to this hypocritical showmanship. They desired to look good. They wanted the personal gain, the personal glory. So they pretended generosity. Another nuance here, possible little angle is, it may even be that when Ananias and Sapphira watched Barnabas bring this gift and receive public accolades and watched how people said, oh, Barnabas, that's so encouraging. Thanks for that gift. It's going to help so many people that at that moment they may have been prone to jealousy. Well, what's so great about Barnabas? Son of encouragement, you know. What's so great about, I mean, I could sell a piece of property and give the money to the church. In fact, I think I will. I'll sell it and I'll go because, I mean, I follow Jesus too. I love the Lord just as much as he does. Why should he be getting all that credit? Again, it's just theoretical. But if you or someone you know is prone to jealousy, you could see how Maybe that would trigger something in them to want to receive that public glory and attention. And whether it was one of these possibilities or some other thing I haven't really suggested, the main thing we need to know is that Ananias and Sapphira got caught. They were busted. And God judges them severely. The sin isn't the small amount of their gift or the low percentage of their gift. It's their deception. God powerfully preserves his church's purity. At this beginning juncture in the early church, God steps in, says, not in my church. One author notes, love of praise and love for money led to the first recorded sin in the life of the church. And it is a warning to the future readers. God cannot be mocked. And God chooses to reveal his awesome holiness in such a way that verse 11 concludes, great fear seized the whole church and all who heard about these events. See, it was a public offering that was brought in. And so when these people fell dead, it was in a public setting, and the word spread, and it created a great fear and a great reverence, a great reminder that God is holy. And on the one hand, the severity of God's divine judgment really does highlight his holiness that he does not tolerate sin. He is a holy God. And that's a reminder that we can always stand to hear. But on the other hand, it also magnifies God's ongoing mercy. In other words, the severe discipline poured out on Ananias and Sapphira reminds the rest of us just how often God does not treat us as our sins deserve. Can you just imagine if God were this direct and this immediate every time he saw a sin of hypocrisy in the church? Every time he saw one of us being greedy or being jealous, being vain? Frankly, I'd have nobody to preach to. You'd all be in the grave plot. And I wouldn't be here preaching. Because I'd be in the grave plot. We're so fortunate for God's patience, for his mercy. And yet it's so important that we remember that he has the right to judge sin. That he he can call us out anytime he wants to, well within his rights, to bring justice. Now, the early church didn't let this incident stop the forward progress of the gospel. In fact, verses 13 and 14, if we jump ahead a little bit, they go on to say, no one else dared join them, even though they were highly regarded by the people. 
Nevertheless, more and more men and women believed in the Lord and were added to their number. In other words, because of the fate of Ananias and Sapphira, no pretenders or half-hearted followers risked identification with the church. I don't know if I want to go over to that church. (laughs) Their God takes things seriously. Those people take devotion to Jesus seriously. I mean, can you imagine if you were the next person who brought money to bring (laughs) before Paul, or sorry, before Peter and the apostles? That would be a sobering moment. Like, you'd be kind of treading in kind of softly and maybe have the bill of sale and say, just want you to see. (laughs) There was no room for pretenders in the early church. So no one else dared join them, not lightheartedly at least. And yet it does say that more and more believed in the Lord. This group of 5,000 was growing and spreading because some were very much drawn to the genuineness and the authenticity and the full devotion to Jesus. Well, the early church teaches us at least two things about reverent giving. First of all, we shouldn't be generous in order to get praise. The fact is, Jesus himself did say, in fact, it's later on in Acts where it's quoted, it is more blessed to give than to receive. And there are blessings for being a generous person. It's great to be generous. Lots of positive reasons to be generous and and lots of reasons why it's a blessing to be able to be a blessing to others. But seeking praise from other people shouldn't be our motivation for being generous. Another thing that the early church can teach us about reverent giving is that if God prompts us to give, we should follow through. All of these resources we have, no matter how many or how few we may think they are, God has entrusted us with them. And he wants us to steward them for his purposes, for his glory. The greed and hypocrisy that was displayed by Ananias and Sapphira, you see, it was not just a sin against God. It was also a sin against the church family. And here's what I mean by that. By giving less than what God had apparently prompted them to give They weren't bringing in the resources that were needed for the ministry. In other words, the reason God was prompting their hearts to give was to support the ministry of the church. And so their disobedience, their failure to follow through, created a potential shortfall in ministry funding. Consider Paul's advice about giving in 2 Corinthians 8.11. Now finish the work so that your eager willingness to do it may be matched by your completion of it. This brings us back to that idea of good intentions. Perhaps some of us from time to time have thought, yeah, this this is the time. I need to start giving some money to help the poor. I need to start giving to the church to support ministries and nonprofits. It's Man, I've thought about it a long time. A few times I've even decided to do it, and I I just never quite finished following through. But this time, I'm going to start. November is going to be my month, November 2020. But, you know, I I don't have my checkbook with me, (laughs) and I I don't carry cash. Just never seem to find time to set up electronic giving. And on and on we go with procrastination, with excuses. Brothers and sisters in Christ, as you look at this verse, is your eager willingness to do it, is it being matched by your completion of it? If God's Spirit has prompted us to give, then let's finish the work. Let's jump in. Let's support the ministry the way God is prompting us to do that. At Ephraim Bemidji, let's make sure that as we're becoming fully devoted followers of Jesus, that it even applies to our financial giving. 
just like Barnabas. Let's be an encouragement to the church by practicing reverent giving. Let's pray together. Lord, we do thank you for the way you provide for us. And I'm very well aware that there may be some who are really struggling financially right now. And the point of this message wasn't to uh, put any more pressure on them. So Lord, I just pray for any brother or sister in Christ who might really be struggling financially that as a church we might step up and meet that need. That like the early church, the reputation of our church and the, the actual truth about our church is that there are no needy persons among us. May you be honored and glorified as we love each other that way. As we know each other well enough to know when someone's struggling and step in to help. Heavenly Father, thank you for this story from the history of the early church. Please help us to learn from it, to apply its lessons to our own lives. And may each one of us practice this voluntary kind of reverent generosity that will bring you glory that will accomplish your purposes on this earth. <coughs> we ask this together in Jesus' name, and all God's people said, amen.